Today we're going to be talking about uh, a theme that I think is um, just crucial to understand that is often uh, misunderstood, and it's the subject of spiritual warfare taught throughout the scriptures. A uh, boy was asking his father, my mom was in the kitchen, they were cleaning up after supper, and he said, Dad, how do wars start? And the father said, well, World War I, for example, started when Germany invaded Belgium. And the wife hearing that said, you're trying to soften it for the boy. Tell him the truth. Someone was murdered. And he stood up and said, well, who's answering this question? You or me? And she went out of the kitchen with a huff and slammed the door. And then the uh, dishes stopped rattling in the cupboard. There was a long silence. And the boy said to his dad, Dad, you need, don't need to tell me now. I understand how wars start. <laughs> and it's really it's as simple as that. It's uh, usually selfishness that starts wars, and that was the beginning of the first war. Um, unfortunately, Jesus said there will be wars and rumors of wars, but the end is not yet, and we've seen plenty of war in human history. Someone said just in the last 3,600 years, uh, the world has known only 292 years of peace out of 3,600. During this period, there have been 1,400, 1, I'm sorry, 14,531 wars, large and small, in which 3 trillion 640, no, 3 billion 640 million people have been killed in these wars through history. The value of destruction would pay for a golden belt around the world, 97 miles in width, and 33 feet thick. That's how much has been spent on war. Biggest part of the American budget is the military. Matter of fact, America has the largest military budget of any country in the world. Well, we are at war. There is a war that is going on right now. Uh, we don't like to think about it. If you're a Christian, you think, well, I don't want to be involved in war, then you're, um, then you're, yeah, you're, you're, you're missing out on what's really going on around you. And that's just the way the devil would like to have it. Uh, a lot of churches and pastors are telling people, you come to Jesus and everything is smooth sailing. In reality, you become an adversary of the enemy when you decide to be a Christian, and you will encounter all kinds of resistance. If you do not sense the war that is going on between the forces of good and evil, even in your own life, if you don't see it in the country, then it might be because you're in the river going towards destruction and you're not swimming against the current. As soon as you begin to swim against the current, you're going to know something about that war. Pastor Billy Sunday used to uh, preach frequently about sin and repentance. And, and one day someone came to him and said, Pastor Sunday, will you please stop rubbing the cat's fur the wrong way? He says, you're always rubbing the cat's fur the wrong way. And Billy Sunday said, that's because the cat needs to turn around. Then I'll be rubbing the fur the right way. And uh, in the world, Jesus said, if the world hated me, it's going to hate you. There is a conflict going on. There is a clash of kingdoms that is taking place in the world today. Now, many nations have been overcome because they were lulled to sleep by the enemy, being told there was no threat of war. The devil doesn't want us to be aware that there's a war going on. You know, one of the most embarrassing moments for the United States was 9-11, was uh, Pearl Harbor, <laughs> not much 9-11 when uh, our military was attacked. And you know, when the military was attacked, the Japanese had peace ambassadors in Washington talking about a peace treaty. And so everybody thought, oh, they won't attack now. And they did it on a Sunday morning uh, after everyone had had a night out on the town. And they basically caught the American Navy unprepared. And uh, of course, we got even at the end, but uh, it was very embarrassing. They took advantage of that truth that you lull your enemy into thinking that there really is no war, that we're all friends. Can't we all just get along? The devil wants us to say, oh yeah, let's just do our best to get along. We don't want to be at war. Well, you just need to make up your mind who you want to be at war with. Uh, you are either in the devil's hands, and Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're what? You're against me. And you're on the losing team, if you didn't know that. Or you decide to follow Jesus, and that's going to aggravate the devil. 
but Jesus wins in the end. And so, but you can't escape that we are in this world and there is a battle, there is a war going on. You know, the uh, Hitler was able to trick the Russians into signing a peace treaty just before World War II so they would not resist his invasion of Poland and then later he attacked them in spite of the peace treaty and they were not prepared for that first initial attack. Nazis marched almost all the way to Moscow because he had lulled them into thinking, you don't need to make war preparations, I'm going to give you an, a treaty, uh, we're going to have a pact, everything's going to be okay. Uh, and that's the way the devil works. He doesn't want us to be aware there's a war because if you think there's a war, you will prepare. Who was it? Norman Schwarzkopf that said, the more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. What he means by that is, in the times of peace, you need to be preparing and sweating so that when the war does come, you don't bleed. And that's a good policy of preparing. You know, a few years ago, I was on an airplane and I um, was offered this free um, book. It was some audible book program and, and one of the free books they offer you, everything else you pay for, was um, it was a book called The Art of War by Sun Tzu. And it was, it's an ancient book, it goes back to like three, two thousand years before Christ. A Chinese warrior, writer, general, uh, wrote this book on the art of war and it's full of all kinds of very interesting dynamics and the book has recently become a bestseller again because people realize the principles about the art of war also apply not only to war but they apply to business. And in many ways they apply to the Christian life. There are certain basic principles. For one thing he said, if you're ignorant both of your enemy and yourself you are certain to be in peril. So before two boxers go into the ring, if it's any kind of an important fight, uh, their managers will sit down and they will look at film or video or DVD of the matches of the opponent. And they will look at it and they will study it frame by frame and they'll say, ah, notice what this guy does, is when you do a fake he does a duck and that'll leave him open to an uppercut and they evaluate all of the habits of the opponent so they can train their fighter when you go in, this is what his habit is, this is what his tactics are, and these need to be your tactics to win. Now, I don't like it when people are preoccupied with talking about the devil. Uh, I don't want to do it any more than God does it, but Jesus does it. And Jesus talks about the devil so that we will know something about the tactics of the enemy, and we will not be taken off guard, and we will be prepared. Something else you need to be aware of, you know, the devil is out there, we've got guardian angels, but the devil's got fallen angels. Just like God has guardian angels, the devil's probably appointed angels to study especially the weaknesses of Christians, and uh, they're going to study your tactics. They're going to study your weaknesses, and they're going to exploit that to do what they can to get you to sin or become discouraged or give up in your faith. And so, being aware that there is someone who's out to get you helps you prepare. So there is a battle going on, and it's also taking place in heavenly places. It's a tragic misconception Christians have of what it means to take up the cross and follow Jesus. We are part of two clashing kingdoms. Christians are not invited to a picnic, we are recruited to the front lines of a severe conflict. The words the Bible uses to describe the Christian life are war, wrestling, fighting, striving, battling, running. We are called, according to Paul, to be soldiers. And yet you seldom hear about that. People are saying, just come to Jesus, everything's okay. It's a struggle. There's a struggle. It's wrestling. You ever wrestle? Ephesians 6, we just heard, we wrestle not. Uh, when I was in military school, I was on a wrestling team. And um, wrestling, uh, I used to box too, but wrestling is different. Uh, you know, in in boxing you're supposed to just hit above the waist and you get the certain rules, but wrestling you just get in there and you grapple and you pit all of your strength against your opponent and you're pushing with all your might and they are pushing with all of your might and you're in close contact, sometimes much closer than you want to be, in trying to uh, overthrow and pin that person. In Bible times they didn't shoot guns. 
They might throw a spear or fire an arrow, but then they eventually engage the enemy, and it often turned into hand-to-hand -hand combat. A few times in World War I and World War II, they had encounters where it turned into hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now everything is, you know, aircraft and drones and mechanized war, but uh, back then it was wrestling with the enemy, like Jacob wrestled with a heavenly force. We sometimes have to wrestle, and uh, we need to be aware that that's the reality. Now, I meet people all the time, and when they read the Bible, they say, Pastor Doug, why is the Old Testament so full of wars and battles? And there's also some in the New Testament, but I said, that's because all of those, they're real history, but they're also allegories. Every one of those battles tells us something about how someone was overcome and how we can overcome the enemy. And some of the favorite reading for me is going through the stories in the Old Testament of the various kings and the various battles because you learn lessons that prepare you and how to fight against the battles that come to us as Christians. And we may consider some of those along the way. All right, why are we at war? Where did it all begin? How did We didn't ask to be enlisted as soldiers. We were drafted from the time we were born. And you were drafted again when you were born again. It started in heaven. You know, the Bible says in Ephesians, these are spiritual powers in heavenly places. Revelation 12, verse 7, a war broke out in heaven. There you have it. A war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Now I want to pause here and just get you to think about something. Who is stronger, Christ or Satan? Uh, Jesus. The Creator has to be stronger than the creation, right? Um, why did they have to fight? Couldn't Jesus have just said, be gone? And Satan and his angels would just have to leave. But somehow, God allowed his natural laws of cause and effect to play out, and it turned into a battle angel on angel. Why did he let it happen that way? Hold that thought, and I'm going to elaborate on it a little later, but it was a war. Now, if they had to fight a real war in heaven, we're probably not getting off the hook here because the war has moved from there to here. Satan was cast out. I'm in verse 9. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So we're down here with angels that have been expelled. Satan has basically hijacked and kidnapped the planet. Even Jesus said in Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. He's come to the earth. And Revelation warns us, chapter 12, verse 12, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Why are they rejoicing? Satan's been cast out. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Why? Because he's been cast in. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows he has a short time. Satan right now claims he is a prince of this world. Indeed, even Jesus said, the prince of this world comes. He is called the prince of the power of the air by Paul. And so the devil claims this is his dominion. So when you say, I do not recognize your dominion, I serve another king, you become a target of the devil. Now how many of you would like to get the devil's attention? Every hand should have gone up. Think about it. When you say, I don't want the devil's attention, you're saying, I don't want to cause any problems for him. But if you want to please the Lord, then you need to resist him. Isn't that right? And give him a hard time. But we already have enough problems from the devil. We're thinking, I don't want to invite more trouble. But there's no third, you can't go to Switzerland, friends, I'm sorry. There's no neutral country. The only way that you escape being enlisted in the army of God is when you die or Jesus comes. Until then, you are going to be in a battle. The good thing about a battle is a battle is not a whole war. There are breaks between battles. You know, the um, pilots sometimes say being an airline pilot is unending hours of monotony punctuated with moments of terror. And being a soldier is something like that too. There are spells of monotony that are punctuated with the terror of battle. And then you wait and wait and wait. You hurry up and you wait. Any of you in the military? 
You do all this preparation, you hurry up and then you wait. It's monotony. So there fortunately are some breaks. And what are you supposed to do on those breaks between battles? Take it easy or clean your rifle and be prepared. Sharpen your sword. Be prepared for what's coming. This is what Paul is telling us in Ephesians. And you read in the last verse, I'm still in Revelation 12 verse 17, the dragon was enraged with the woman. Who's the woman? The church. That's Christ's children. Every believer. He is what? He's enraged. And he went to make, what's that three letter word? War. The devil went to make war with the rest of her offspring and they're identified by those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Some Christians do not feel any war because they don't keep the commandments and the devil's not enraged with them. So I ask you again, how many of you want to make the devil mad? Oh, you're getting the idea. How many of you want to make the, the Lord glad? You got to choose. Make the devil mad, make the Lord glad. Or vice versa. I don't want the wrath of the Lamb. Now when we talk about the war, there are really two different aspects of the war. You've got uh, the internal war and the external war, even in spiritual warfare. You've got, in any war, you've got offense and defense. Uh, some wars in the Bible were fought where they were defending their city because they were attacked from the outside and they're just trying to maintain survival. Other times, like when Joshua went into the promised land, they went out conquering and to conquer. That's a quote from uh, Revelation. So they were told to take this territory that belonged to them. As a Christian, we're involved in both office, offense and defense. A lot of us are always on the defense. We're so worried about being overcome by the enemy that we're always thinking, you know, how can I resist temptation? But you don't want to stop there. Because as a Christian, you're also wanting to go out and conquer for Christ to reach other people. A biblical word that helps to give that uh, dual nature here. Genesis 14, 14, you know the story. Lot and his family living in Sodom is a bad place to set up house. Uh, they are attacked by Chedorlaomer and these five kings from the north. And they come down and they kidnap they seize all the people from Sodom and Gomorrah and those cities of the plain. They take them back up towards Damascus. Abraham gets word of it. And it says in Genesis 14, 14, Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive. It's actually his nephew. He armed his 318 trained servants. He must have had a big household because he's got 300 that are trained with war. How do you like that? Abraham, what's his job? General Abraham? You ever call him General Abraham? No. Captain? Sergeant Abraham? No. We were saying Shepherd Abraham. But he knew in order to have peace, he needed to be prepared for war. So before Lot was ever taken captive, he had 318 in his household that were ready to fight. So are you training for battle? Are you sharpening the sword of the word? He took his soldiers that were trained born in his own house and he went in pursuit as far as Dan, that's way up in the north, and he divided his forces against them by night. He knew something about uh, military strategy. And he and his servants attacked them. You know the most important element in battle? Surprise. Surprise. He attacked them by night and he pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all of the goods and all of, he brought back his brother Lot and all the goods as well as the women and the people. So Abraham was not just content to defend his, his little enclave, but he went out and he rescued those who were captive. These are the two ways that we do battle spiritually is we're trying to keep from being uh, taken ourselves and we want to rescue those who are taken captive by the enemy. That's why we're involved in a church to help people maintain and to help them uh, in outreach. It's in reach and it's outreach. Amen? So let's talk a little bit about this inner war that we all deal with. 1 Peter 2 11, let's establish there is a war. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. You know what a sojourner and a pilgrim is? Someone traveling through. You're, this is not full time. This world is not our home. Soldiers are often on the move. I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts 
the war against the soul. When we give in to the desires of the flesh, it wars against you spiritually. It consumes you. It's like a cancer spiritually. God does not want us to be controlled by the flesh. You got two natures at war. You got the spirit and the flesh. And if we're always catering to the flesh, wanting to always do everything for our own ease, we don't practice self-denial, then you end up being controlled by the flesh instead of by the spirit. And you're losing the spiritual war. James 4.1 where do wars and fightings come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Your members, doesn't talk about church members or Costco members, it's talking about the members of your body, uh, in your heart, your hand, your head, your feet, your, within you. There's a war going on and between the spirit and the flesh. Galatians 5.17 For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another, like oil and water. You, they don't get along. You can't say, I want to be spiritually and fleshly minded at the same time. It's not going to happen. It's one or the other. And if you want to serve God, you've got to say, Lord, I want to be led by your spirit and you must fight against and resist the controlling carnal nature. Now, you know what the problem is? You've got both. As long as you're in this world, you're going to be part animal. That's the carnal, the flesh. In Spanish, the way you say meat is carne, right? Have you ever been to a carnival? You know where it gets its word? The Roman Colosseum, they had these circuses that were so brutal and bloodthirsty that if they, the flesh was everywhere. It comes from the Latin word meaning carne, carnage. You ever use that word? And so it gives you, when you go to the California State Fair, just think carnival. <laughs> Next, I ruined it for you, didn't I? <clears throat> that was my plan. So the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, they're contrary to one another. So you do not do the things you wish. Whenever we fall, it's because this is war going on. Now I'm going to venture on dangerous ground. Romans chapter 7. Paul talks about this. For I know that in me, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For the will, in my mind, I want to do the will of God, is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I don't find. It's not natural. For the good that I will to do, I do not. But the evil I do not, that I practice. Now if I do not what I will not to do, it's no longer I, but sin that dwells in me. We've just got these sinful natures that are always gravitating towards the selfish things and the, the carnal nature of the flesh. I find in a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, meaning the spiritual man, in my heart. But I see another law, it's that carnal nature, in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me in captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Now the good news is, if you go to Romans chapter 8, he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now this isn't pretty, but one of the things ancient generals would do, or kings, when they captured and conquered someone, if they wanted them to die just the very worst death, they would not only imprison them, but they would chain them to a dead body. Uh, that's a horrific thought. They'd chain it to their back, and they'd make them bear that in the jail. And while this dead body was there putrefying, it would, the contagion would eventually permeate themselves, and they would be killed by it. Um, I know it's an ugly picture. That's what Paul says. I have to tell you. That's what he means. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Wouldn't that be terrible if you had to carry around a dying, decomposing corpse on your body? It's kind of the way Paul describes this carnal nature. We've all got this uh, fleshly side that's just selfish. We're wanting to do what is good for us. We're wanting, it's controlled by pride. That's how the devil fell. It's controlled by satisfying our own desires, putting ourselves first. It's controlled by selfishness. And yet you say, I want to be like Jesus. But I got this nature, this, <laughs> this corpse <laughs> that is dragging me down all the time. Who will deliver me from this? And the answer is given in chapter 8. Thank God, through Jesus Christ, we no longer have to walk after the flesh but we can now walk by the Spirit. You can live a new spiritual life. 
There's a story in the Bible where this man is on a bed. He can't do anything. He's controlled by this bed. He's crippled. He's paralyzed. He gets four friends to bring him to Jesus. They finally lower him through the roof into the presence of Jesus. Jesus forgives his sin and then he heals him. He says, take up your bed and go to your house. Now that man was so tired of that dirty bed that carried him around. But after Jesus healed him, does he still have his bed? He does. You know what the difference is? When he came to Christ, the bed carried him. After Jesus set him free, he carried the bed. Once you come to Jesus, you may still have sinful desires, but they don't have dominion over you anymore. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. The Lord rules in your life. Doesn't mean Christians don't fall. We don't struggle. And when we do, we know how Paul feels when he describes the thing I don't want to do, I do. But right away, we should repent and turn from those things and ask God to help us really be led by the Spirit and walk by the Spirit. Amen? And Paul goes on to say in Ephesians 6, For we, he's including himself, do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Don't you wish you could just punch the devil in the nose? You could go, you know, take a, take a course in kickboxing or something and fight the devil. It's not that easy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So, what are some of the ways that uh, we can overcome? Well, first of all, soldiers need discipline. One of the most important things that uh, happened in my life was, I remember, <laughs> I was... Uh, talking to my mom. I had a friend I'd visited. Actually, I just reconnected with him after 50 years. And uh, he had been to New York Military Academy and he had his first year there and he said it was great. And he was telling me, he and his brother Danny, Danny and Bobby, went to military school and they were our best friends. They told us how wonderful it was. I said, Mom, that's what I need. I was in trouble in school all the time and not having a father in the home, my mom raising, uh, we were in trouble Moms aren't always the disciplinarians that dad is. And I thought, I said, I need discipline. I was young enough, I was only like 11, but I knew I'm out of control. Uh, mom's letting me get away with way too much. I see my friends and their parents and how they act. I said, you know, I need discipline. I knew that. I said, I said, mom, I said, this is the thing. It might be my last chance. That's what I told her. I said, this might be my last chance. I said, you need to send me to NEMA, New York Military Academy, by the way, which is where Donald Trump went. But I didn't know him because he's older than I am. I want you to know that. <laughs> and uh, so she sent me. I went there for two years. And you know what? Boy, I cried and I felt so sorry for myself. And I was homesick. And they used to beat you there. That was before it was illegal. Yeah, you, when I would say beat you, they didn't just beat you. I mean, but you misbehaved. They'd hit you. They'd lay you across the desk. They'd whip you with a belt. I mean, it was rough. And they, we couldn't act like little boys. I mean, we had to march everywhere and there was a rules about everything and you had to make your bed. And if it wasn't made, they'd tear it apart and say, make it again. And, <laughs> I felt so sorry for myself. And, but you know what? Through all that misery, I was learning. It was boot camp. And your first year there, you're called a newbie. And to this day, every time anybody that had been there longer stopped me, they, they say, newbie. And I'd go, hey, sir, new sir, guy, sir, is sir, thus sir, scum, sir, us sir, thus sir, earth, sir, sir. You know what I said? You, they say, a new guy is the scum of the earth. I am, I think you have to say that. It was humiliating. You had to stand at attention like this and repeat that. Or you get punished even worse. And there's reasons why they do the things they do in the military. They are teaching discipline. They're teaching obedience. They're teaching self-control. They're teaching self-denial. Because when those soldiers are two or three days without sleep fighting, you better, you can't go, I want to go home. You, you got to learn how to toughen it up. And this is why Paul says to Timothy, you've got to learn to endure hardship as a good soldier of Christ. The truth be known, the church is really soft. There is very little self-denial. There is very little discipline in the church. You don't hear much about fasting and self-denial, and prayer, and, and going out and, and sharing and distributing literature or, or visiting others when you don't feel like it. We're being taught to be a very selfish, feel-good church. 
Pastors go out to raise a church in a community and they'll do a survey and find out what does everybody in this community want? They want donuts? Let's give them donuts. And you raise up a church of people that like donuts. And they don't learn about taking up a cross and following Christ and fighting battles and being soldiers. We've gotten soft. So soul, you need discipline if you're going to be a soldier. Numbers 32, verse 6, Moses said to the children of Gad and the children of Reuben, will your brethren go to war while you sit here? We've got a lot of churches that are just sitting there while everyone else is going to war. 1 Corinthians 9, 26, therefore, Paul said, I run not with uncertainty, I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others I myself should be overcome or disqualified. Every Christian, we need a Christian boot camp these days. Soldiers need courage. We need strong morale. We need to believe in what we're doing. We need to believe we're going to win. If the devil can discourage us and make us lose faith, faith is everything for the Christian. That's the morale I'm talking about, right? right. You know the story where Caleb went before the children of Israel with Joshua and ten other spies and they did reconnaissance in the promised land. They came back and Joshua and Caleb said, let us go at once into this land flowing with milk and honey. We can take them. They're nothing. We can beat them. And the other ten said, oh no. They're too big. They're too strong in the walls and their armaments. And we were like grasshoppers. And they discouraged the children of Israel. They lost morale and you can't fight like that. They wandered forty years. Why? They lost faith. You need to have courage. Notice what happens after 40 years go by. Now Joshua is getting ready to enter the promised land again. Joshua who was a spy, he's now the commander. Listen to what God says to Joshua. Chapter 1 verse 5. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and good of good courage. For this people will divide an inheritance in the land that I swore to their fathers, I promised to give them. Only be strong and very courageous that you might do all according to the law that Moses my servant commanded you. Have not I commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. The Lord your God is with you. What is God trying to say to Joshua? Don't make that mistake of losing faith they made 40 years earlier. You can whip them. Amen. And did they? They won every battle except the battle with Ai because there was an Achan in the camp. And that was a pretty, they lost 36 men. But they won every other battle uh, because they had courage. So God wants us to have that kind of courage. You know before the children of Israel would go into battle, Moses said the priests will stand before the soldiers. Before they go into battle they'd make an, an announcement. And the priest would say, what man is there here who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house, lest the heart of his brethren faint like his heart in the battle. If you're going to stick around and be, oh me, oh my, I can't be a Christian, I'm going to get overcome, and who can be a Christian? Who can walk holy? It's not possible. You're just going to discourage everybody else. What we need is more people that say, yes you can. Give testimonies of how God has given us victory. Encourage everybody else that you can be victorious. Instead of hearing all these sermons and testimonies about how I overcome, but thank you for His grace. I mean, I, I appreciate His grace. You know what I'm talking about? Is everybody's highlighting their overcoming. We're not highlighting any victories. I don't want to be a soldier that loses, do you? We want to, we want to believe in the victory. Something else very important when it comes to uh, a battle is communications. You know, uh, the first thing that happened during the Gulf War is when we were trying to take on Baghdad and uh, they maybe didn't have weapons of mass destruction but they definitely were gassing people. I mean, that, Saddam Hussein was not a good dude. You know that. And they were torturing people and doing terrible things. So when they attacked, they took out their communication facilities. First thing they did, they blasted the radios, they blasted the antennas, and pretty soon they couldn't talk to each other. And if you can knock out their communications, they don't know what the orders are, they don't know what to do, and they crumble. You know what the devil tries to do with us? Knock out our communications. 
if we're not in contact with our commander, there's confusion. We need to daily, regularly be talking to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 14.8 If the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for the battle? You know, back in battle times, right next to the commander was a guy with a trumpet and he would give the different signals telling the troops what to do. You've probably all seen the cowboy and Indian movie where when it looks like the fort is going to fall and everything's hopeless for the settlers, all of a sudden off in the distance you hear a bugle it means all oh, the cavalry's coming to rescue us. That was the bugle sound for charge. And if you're in the military, you used to go to sleep at night, you'd hear what's that called? They played that over the loudspeaker every day in our military school and in the morning the most annoying sound I ever heard was <laughs> every morning on the loudspeaker they play Rivoli. Well they also had signals for flank right, flank left, retreat, they had the bugler was given the signal. Well the military knew if you can knock out the bugler the bugler would stay as close to the captain, he was usually pretty safe. But if you could knock out the bugler, there'd be chaos on the field. Because the communications broke down. That's why the Bible says, that you smite the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. And if we don't pray, Ephesians 6.18, talking about the spiritual warfare, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Not just praying for ourselves, but praying for the saints. Soldiers must watch. Talked about communications. I just mentioned watchful to this end. Ezekiel 33. So you, son of man, I have made a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore you shall hear the word from my mouth and warn them from me. Over and over again, Jesus tells us about the importance of being watchful. Watch and pray. When does the devil attack? You know, it's often after a victory the devil attacks. Or he attacks you when you're tired, hungry. And these are the moments when you're not suspecting it and you're the most vulnerable. When did he come to Jesus? 40 days of fasting. When did he come to David? After victory over all the nations? David's just letting Joab mop up and he's on his palace roof. He's victorious. And there's Bathsheba. Now that was a spiritual war. It started as a spiritual war that manifested itself in the physical. Somebody, some demon told Bathsheba, I know it's broad daylight, but most of the soldiers are gone. Go take a bath in the courtyard. And another devil said, David, why don't you go out and get some fresh air? And I'm sure that was all orchestrated by evil spirits in heavenly places, so to speak. And so uh, you need to be watchful. Because the devil is always working to bring us down. Mark 13, 33. Take heed, Jesus said. Watch and pray. How do we watch? He tells us. Pray. For you do not know what that time is. It's like a man going into a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants, to each one his work. And he commanded the doorkeeper, whether it's a guard on the tower or a doorkeeper, watch. Verse 35. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, or at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all. Last words Jesus say, watch. He said, watch, watch, watch. And what does he mean watch? Mark 14, 38, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. So how do we keep from temptation? We watch through prayer. Be sober, be vigilant through prayer. Praying, how often Paul said, praying always. Being in an attitude of prayer. Constant communion with God. You know it's hard to sin when you're talking to God. Next time you're tempted, get on your knees and pray and you're going to find it very hard to give, give in. You know what your biggest battle is going to be? I don't know if I want to pray. Bible says we're supposed to run from temptation but most of us crawl hoping it catches us. If you choose and make up your mind to pray when you know you're being tempted, you're going to find it's a lot easier to overcome because God will draw near. And who wants to sin in the presence of God? That's very uncomfortable, right? Draw close to God and it'll give you the strength. So that's how we watch and pray. 
Now it looks like time permits for me to take you to another example of how this plays out. Prayer wins spiritual wars. Spiritual wars are won and lost often through prayer. If you go to Daniel chapter 10 for just a minute, I'm going to look at three verses here. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Daniel 10. In the beginning of the chapter we find that Daniel is fasting and praying. He's doing a simple fast. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. He was mourning over the condition of Israel. He was mourning over what was going to happen to the people of God he had heard from through the uh, visions. I ate no pleasant food, nor meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. So he humbles himself. Daniel is fasting and praying for how long? Three weeks. And he's praying for God's people because the prince of Persia, the king of Persia, was supposed to, Cyrus, let the people go back to Jerusalem. It hadn't happened yet. Daniel 10 verse 12, an angel appears and says, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. An angel comes 21 days later, but he comes because of Daniel's prayer. But the angel goes on, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Now who can withstand an angel? He's not talking about Cyrus. He's talking about the devil. See, in the same way that it was the devil that told Herod to kill the babies in Bethlehem, you can often see through history it was the devil that worked behind the king of Tyre in chapter 14 of Isaiah. And, or the king of Babylon and in uh, Ezekiel, it's the king of Tyre, is it's the devil behind them all. So it's saying the devil resisted me. This I think is very interesting. Well, he withstood me how long? 21 days. How long was Daniel praying? 21 days. And behold Michael, one of the chief princes, and many believe that Michael is another word for Christ, it's Christ pre-incarnation. He is the Son of God. And when it says chief princes, it means the chief or the highest of, uh, of all, came to help me, for I had been left alone with the kings of Persia. Now, why would it take an angel 21 days? Why does Michael need to be called? Notice this, Daniel 10 verse 20. Then he said to me, Do you not know why I have come to you? Now I must return and fight with the prince of Persia. This is an angel talking. For I've gone forth. Indeed the prince of Greece will come. So you get the picture here? There's a battle in heavenly places. Daniel is praying that the Holy Spirit and providence will move uh, the king of Persia, Cyrus, to finally let the people go back to the promised land and fulfill their destiny. And the devil is resisting that happening. And the angels are fighting against the devil. And it doesn't just happen like that. I don't know what they're doing up there in heavenly places, but those fallen angels have some power. Fortunately, there's twice as many good angels as bad angels. I think if our eyes were open right now and we could see the battles raging in heavenly places for our souls, it would terrify us. We'd pray more, I promise you that, if you saw the kind of battles that are fighting uh, for us, we pray more. David, once a plague was going through Jerusalem, and David's wondering what's going on, he looks above Jerusalem, God opens his eyes, he sees an angel with a sword in his hand because of the pride and the sin of David and the people. A judgment's going through the land, all they see on the ground is the plague. David sees the angel in the air. So there are spiritual things that are happening. And so I always thought it was amazing that three weeks go by and he says, and the battle's not over yet. We've got to go back and fight against these spiritual forces. I always thought, oh, good angels, slam dunk. They can wipe out an evil angel right away. Not so easy in the Bible. There's something going on. You know what made the difference in um, this prayer being answered? Daniel praying 31 days moved the hand of heaven and a nation was released from bondage, but it wasn't without a struggle. I just summarized what I read. Daniel praying, a one person on earth fasting and praying, mobilized angels in heaven to come and to strive with the evil angels that were manipulating the powers of earth until finally Cyrus let the people go home. Would God we had more people on earth praying Amen? Yes. To move things in heaven. There are battles that are going on. 
Something else about an army. Do you know an army marches on its stomach? You ever heard that? They don't march on their feet. They march on their stomach. You stop feeding soldiers and you watch what happens. They can't fight. I remember reading in the Bible that uh, 1 Samuel 30, David went and his 600 men who were with him, they came to the brook Besor. They're trying to rescue their families that have been kidnapped by the Amalekites. And they left some behind. David pursued, he and 400 men. For 200 stayed behind. They were so weary they could not cross the brook. They were actually malnourished. You read in 1 Samuel 14, Saul, King Saul made a really dumb order. He said, do not eat until I've been avenged of my enemies. And the soldiers were fighting the Philistines. They won the first battle, but then they got hungry. And they couldn't fight anymore. Jonathan saw some honey on the ground. He ate the honey and he said, look how my, my strength and my blood sugar has been revived so I can keep fighting just from a little honey. You should have let the soldiers eat. We would have had a bigger victory. You know how the devil tries to overcome the church? You can read in 2 Kings chapter 6, it says that the king of Syria surrounded the Israelites in the north and he starved them through besieging the city so they couldn't fight. He starved them so they couldn't fight. Now what am I talking about when I say a, an army marches on its stomach? The bread of life. If you want to be able to fight, you need to feed. I saw there was a National Geographic uh, article talked about the bull moose in, in uh, Alaska and in Canada that, you know, they, they get into a big fight in the fall about who's going to be the big moose and get all the, the does, is that what they call the female moose? The moosettes? And uh, the, the male moose, they go at it and they use their horns as a principal weapon and whoever has got the most bulk and whoever has the biggest horns usually is the big moose, is the bull moose. And you know how they get the big horns in the bulk? They eat the best food during the summer. Then they're able to fight and win when the battle comes. You and I, if we are feeding our souls now with the best food, we're going to have the spiritual strength to fight when the battle comes. Can you say amen if that made sense? How many of you ever eat canned food? Any canned food? You ever open a can? How many opened a can in the last week? Do you know why we have canned food? Because Napoleon was losing his battle with Russia because he could not get food to his soldiers without it spoiling first. He offered an award of, I think it was 12,000 francs, if someone could invent a way of preserving the food better for his troops, because an army marches on its stomach. And along came Nicholas Apart. He was a confectionery. <laughs> and uh, he found that if he used wine bottles and he boiled the food, he didn't even understand Louis Pasteur's bacteria but he just found that it worked. That if he boiled the vegetables and then corked them and they were putting fruit and peas and, and I wish they'd never invented the canned peas, but they, the, the fruit and the peas and the different things in the bottles and it worked and he ended up getting the award. It was because, you got canned food because Napoleon offered a reward to someone who could help his army march. And Daniel came back from the Marines and he brought home some of his MREs. You ever eat an MRE? <laughs> Meals ready to eat? They've gotten much better, I understand, but it's designed to last. Well, you and I cannot depend on prepackaged food. We need fresh bread every day from the Word of God. Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, I don't want to discourage you when I talk about war. And you think, oh man, don't I get peace? Do you know, you can enjoy peace even in the midst of war. Um, David, who wrote a lot of the Psalms, spent a lot of his life in war. Do you realize David had war with the Philistines? With the Moabites. With the Ammonites. With the Amalekites. With the Edomites. With the Assyrians. Uh, David fought on every front through his life, and he had wars with his own family. Friendly fire. You want to hear a funny story? Somebody in Seattle a few years ago stole a police car and they realized it and they put out, you know, a cop walks out of the coffee shop and his car is gone and they put out an all points bulletin and all these police cars were chasing down this stolen police car. And one of the cars saw the car and be 
began to make chase through the city of Seattle and the car got through an intersection, the light changed, and other cars, were, they couldn't, they had to stop at the light. Well, other cars that had gotten the call, they came ahead, they thought that this was a car that had been stolen. So they rammed their fellow officers. Well, the fellow officers, they thought the guy who had stolen the car had gone around the block and rear-ended them and they thought, we're under attack. So they jumped out of the car and started to fire at them. And then the other police began to fire at the ones they just rammed. And they exchanged 20 rounds. It's a miracle nobody was killed before they realized they were shooting at each other. You know why the church is not doing more to conquer for Christ is we're all firing at each other. Friendly fire. David fought a lot of battles in friendly fire, but I said all that because even though David's life was surrounded by war, he wrote the most beautiful psalms on peace. You can have peace in the midst of a war. I was reading about Stonewall Jackson, an interesting man during the Civil War. He never seemed to be afraid during battle. Matter of fact, that's how he got his name. His name was John. But uh, during the battle, bullets flying everywhere. He's going back and forth up on the hill, uh, surveying his troops and giving orders, standing high in the saddle, looking so calm. And everyone says, look, he's up there on the hill like a stone wall. We can't get past him. Got the name Stonewall Jackson. And they asked him, why aren't you afraid? He always explained extraordinary calm under fire. He said, my religious belief teaches me to feel as safe in battle as in bed. If you're a Christian and you're fighting side by side with King David, you have nothing to fear. You know, I told you the battles in the Bible inspire me. I remember one battle where all the troops retreated. They were fighting the Philistines over a, a field of barley and, and uh, all the troops retreated except David would not retreat. And one of his mighty men named Eliezer, I never could forget his name, it's Eliezer the son of Dodo. And look it up. <laughs> There's not many soldiers like that around anymore because they're extinct. But uh, Eliezer, he saw that David was not retreating and he went and he stood back to back with David and it says David and Eliezer stayed when all the other soldiers retreated and they defeated the Philistines single-handedly. If you're fighting side by side with David, you don't lose. Do you know David never lost a battle? I told you Joshua lost one. David never lost one. You can't name one battle. All those wars. Because he, from the time of Goliath until he closed his eyes, he said... I'm not coming against you in my own strength. I'm coming against you in the strength of the Lord. And God gave him victory. Now, Jesus is called the son of David. And if we are fighting side by side with Jesus, do we need to live lives of fear? Can we still have peace? Jesus has never lost a battle. Follow our commander. John 3, 8. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Jesus is going to win. John 4.4, 4, you've got to remember, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. I told you the devil and his forces have real power, but there's no question who's going to win. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into the captivity of the obedience of Christ. How do we win these battles? Bringing every thought into the captivity of Christ, asking for the Lord to give us a new heart and new mind. Amen? And then we don't have to be afraid. You know, the Salvation Army was formed by a pastor named William Booth. He saw all the, the poor people on the streets and the derelicts and the prostitutes and everybody, all the fine people were in the churches. His heart went out. He said, Jesus spent his time reaching the poor, reaching the sinners. And he used the, some untraditional methods. He went out there and was just preaching the gospel on the street. And it was looked down upon by the clergymen in the church. I thought this is a little unconventional. But he and his wife, Catherine, they started to withdraw from the formal churches and they trained evangelists to go throughout England. They returned to East London in 1865 where many followers joined in their fight for souls 
of lost men and women. Within 10 years, their organization, operating under the name Christian Mission, had a thousand volunteers and evangelists. Thieves, prostitutes, gamblers, drunkards were among their first converts. And these converts were then sent out preaching. And they were singing in the streets as living testimonies to the power of God. Then William Booth read a printer's proof of an 1878 Christian Mission annual report. He noticed a statement, the Christian Mission is a volunteer army. Booth looked at that volunteer army. He crossed out the word volunteer and he put in the word salvation army. And from those words came the basis for what the Salvation Army became. In its heyday, there in England, they had converted 250,000 Christians between 1881 and 1885. Boy, talk about a revival. That's a quarter of a million people. That's just in England. And if you want some entertainment, you look online under the Salvation Army hymnal, they got like 600 songs that are all about fighting because <laughs> they said, we are in a war. They understood, we're in a war against sin. These people were captive by the devil. And it's not just on the streets of London or in downtown Sacramento, but even in churches, there's battles going on for souls. We're battling against sin. And Jesus said that he can save us from our sins. Uh, the weapons of our warfare are mighty. Through prayer, fortifying our minds with the strength of his word, through watching, through sharing our faith with others, you will be strengthened as you share your faith in your own convictions. We can have the ultimate victory.